Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Yes, we're going to take a look at a bit of historic gear here. I've done a previous video on this, a tour of the old analog TV transmission facility at Artaman here in Sydney. And I scored this gear, which was the actual gear used in the rack to transmit the Channel 7 TV signal over most parts, or a good lot, of Sydney here. So really historic bit of gear. And they switched it off, of course. They moved entirely to digital. And this is the original gear that transmitted. Made in around 1981 and it's been in use since then not uh, continuously but because uh, it gets switched in with uh, backup gear and rotated through other gear but this gear itself has you know a couple of hundred thousand hours use out of it so um, you know really well used gear and built like a brick dunny it really is over engineered this sort of stuff very rarely fails so it should be a real interesting teardown but Unfortunately, I apologize up front, there's no way I can do justice to this thing. It doesn't matter how I try and explain things, how I tear things down. We've got the full manuals, the full theory of operation, the uh, schematics, the service manuals, the whole works for this thing. And there's no way that I can really do it uh, justice in depth. So unfortunately, all we're probably going to have to do is a basic overview of the stuff. Then we'll take it apart, have a look at the uh, construction and all. Uh, we'll co might cover uh, some basic operational block diagrams and things like that, but nothing more in depth. I'm sorry, I will try and scan the uh, manuals or, you know, a good lot of it anyway. Um, it could be quite an effort and I'll link those in if you really want the uh, to go into the circuit detail and exactly how it all works. But anyway, this is, you know, pretty much just a teardown. Let's pop the hood on these things and see what they're like. But the first thing we're going to check out is because this stuff is really interesting. The documentation. Hmm. Let's see what documentation was like for a bit of really uh, niche gear. I mean, they would have, I think the serial number on this is like 200 and something like that. They wouldn't have manufactured these only in the hundreds, maybe even the low thousands or something like that worldwide over the lifetime of these actual units. So really not, this is the exact opposite of high volume consumer stuff. Really niche stuff made by NEC in Japan who still make a lot of the uh, TV transmitters used around the world. So it's going to be really interesting, especially the documentation, the amount of work and things they put into this just to, you know, um, support these products, which would have cost a fortune. I don't even know the price. And if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. So here we go. Let's take a look at the documentation. It comes in uh, two binders here. And so we'll take a look at uh, volume one here because I don't think there's a huge amount in volume two that we're interested in. Um, it's the PCN 1205AH VHF TV transmitter. And this documentation is for the entire rack because this is the model number, not just for any one of these bits of gear, but for the entire rack, which NEC sold as a complete system. And this is all of the uh, supporting documentation that went along with it. So like I said, they had to uh, compile this and write this back in uh, the very early 80s, uh, probably, uh, you know, late 70s. A lot of it would have maybe been uh, based on some earlier uh, stuff, perhaps. But this is all around about that vintage. So let's take a look at it. And it has all sorts of different uh, sections in it for um, all of the different, uh, you know, uh, general overview and specs of like the rack and things like that and the overall system, how it works, protection, and then we've got into the maintenance operation and then we've got the individual uh, modules down here, which we'll take a look at. But whew, here we go. I love this death on contact. Look at that. Oh, you don't want to die doing this sort of stuff. Death on contact. High voltage. Warning Will Robinson. Dangerous. Dangerous. It looks like second edition. That one's been added later. CPR. All that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> because, you know, this is serious business. I mean, this um, and not the instruments we're looking at today. I mean, they're just, you know, regular 240 volt um, stuff. You know, a couple of hundred watts uh, output. Things like that of the uh, power amplifier, but in terms of the exciter and the really, you know, high-end, uh, high-power stuff in the rack that uh, generated the uh, couple of kilowatts um, go into the antenna. That's the real dangerous stuff. Anyway, look at this all, uh, you know, all uh, type 
um, all done on uh, typewriter as you can see it's fantastic all different sections all done and somebody's had to put that in a typewriter and done it and here we go I won't go through all the uh, details I'll scan this as I said and you can read through it to your heart's content but here we go the PCN 1200 series is what we got uh, TV transmitters at uh, latest IF modulation type the uh, VHF TV transmitters solid state techniques are more and more using TV transmitter uh, solid state with solid state in so exciter employed concurrent with IF modulation blah blah reduce uh, use tube usage enhance of reliability and reduction of maintenance costs have been realized through uh, full utilization of solid state technique so even back in the 80s here it was a big deal to switch over to uh, solid state uh, stuff and of course the final uh, transmitter is a valve but uh, pretty much everything else is uh, solid uh, state in this thing so here we go composition ah oh. Use of newly de developed steel rack, I love this, assures great strength and superior earthquake proof properties. Well, hey, Japanese company is probably a big deal, you know, <laughs> Japan, Japan is uh, subject to uh, earthquakes, not so much here in Australia, not a big deal, but hey, they've put thought into that, that the uh, transmitters still go during a massive earthquake, natural disaster, that sort of thing. And here's an overview of the rack, which you uh, saw in the previous video, which will be linked in. If you haven't seen it, definitely watch that first. And that's the big uh, three-door. All of the equipment we're looking at was in this one over here. And then, well, well, it'll get a breakdown. Here it is. Here we go. Here's the breakdown of the actual uh, rack itself. So we've got ourselves the, um, this is the gear we're going to look at. We don't have the TX uh, control unit. Um, I'm told there's nothing really interesting there. But we start with the uh, modulation uh, unit. We've got that. That one's going to be a big deal. Um, the IF corrector we don't have. I'm told that's, uh, you know, pretty trivial. Not really uh, hugely anything interesting in there. And in a lot of cases you may actually not need the IF corrector. It's um, Anyway, uh, then we've got the VHF mixer which we'll look at. Um, that won't be hugely interesting because it's just a mixer. I mean, a lot of the analog uh, magic for transmitting the, and modulating and ensuring that the TV signal and audio is high quality is all done in the modulation unit down in here. So the mixer is just, as it says, a mixer to mix the um, IF uh, frequency up to a um, up to the uh, carrier frequency of the transmitter and then we've got the power amplifiers of course separate power amplifier for audio and video as we saw and then here is the big power amplifier Whoa, there we go that one had the big uh, huge multi kilowatt uh, valve in there and then we've got a SIND diplexer over here and that's pretty much um, what constitutes the entire rack system and what this documentation is all about and they talk about the coaxial uh, feeders of course the um, RF uh, coaxial the cooling fare and the exhaust ducts and things like that Ooh, specifications here we go this is uh, rather interesting the unit we're actually looking at here is the PCN 1205 man, little pissy little 5 kilowatt unit ah oh, man hopeless they make them this series went up to 25 kilohertz uh, kilohertz 25 kilowatt um, it transmits the carrier frequency stability. Here we go. It tells you about the TCXO uh, plus minus 150 hertz over a period of one month. There you go. Um, output impedance, input uh, level for the video and the audio, AM noise and uh, all that sort of jazz. Linear distortion uh, for those really into their uh, video stuff. It's all exciting, terribly exciting specs for this thing oh group delay transmission there we go non-linear distortion and as we'll see in the modulator unit all this sort of stuff is a big deal there's lots of tweaks lots of circuitry in there to actually ensure that the video uh, signal the video and audio signals are of the highest quality and they're all tweaked to absolute perfection before they're transmitted out. Output power variation within 2%, the blanking level for the video. Um, the, oh man, what else have we got? Modulation capability, FM noise, AM noise, amplitude versus frequency response. It's in you know, a half a dB flat between that 30 hertz and 15 kilohertz, for example. Harmonic distortion, 0.5%. So if you complain there's too much distortion coming out of your uh, video signal, hey, um, your TV signal, hey, somebody may have, uh, you know, accidentally tweaked the uh, pot on the front panel here. And they've got with well, the various uh, standards they try to uh, meet. 
step response here oh goodness power supply is uh 240 volt or 380 400 415 volt uh three phase voltage fluctuations allow it allows uh two percent uh frequency fluctuation allows two percent and power consumption of course for the uh model we've got five kilowatts oh go figure and there you go um ambient temperature range at minus 10 to plus 45 operational power factor greater than 90 percent up to 95 percent relative humidity and they can operate these up to 2500 meters above sea level which could be important because hey uh you know you want to mount mount these things on the top of mountains pretty much that's where they go so this is a basic uh, block overview of what we're looking at. We've got two of the items here today. As I said, we don't have the corrector here, but uh, basically we've got the uh, audio and video input over here, which comes from the uh, network, you know, Channel 7 network headquarters or something. They microwave in uh, the audio, or these days it used to be microwave, but um, nowadays it's uh, sent via, uh, you know, fiber optic or the internet or some other connection, something like that. The raw, you know, what information they want to send on their TV channel comes from the network goes into the uh, modulator which as I said the modulator is the really interesting uh, bit of kit here because it has all the circuitry that allows you to tweak almost every aspect of the audio and video to get it just as you require it and then it goes into the IF corrector which um, uh, corrects for uh, phase and things like that based on the transmission output because we have multiple transmitters in parallel that's why that can be a big deal when you've got a parallel system when you've got a single uh, transmitter system I believe that one isn't all that hugely important and then we have our VHF mixer which as I said is just really a um, you know a mixer there's not much else uh, to it and then uh, then we have our IF uh, output our visual uh, VHF signal and audio and you'll notice that audio and video is always kept separate right throughout this entire process here let's take a look at the IF modulator shall we the video signal is first fed to the differential amplifier and prevents uh, hum from being superimposed on the video signal by the hum current flowing through the ground line got to be careful system grounding would be you know super important in uh, something in a complete system like this really would so they're using uh, differential amps wherever they can then after level adjusted the video signal which by the way there are various uh, adjustments on the front panel here which will uh, take look at and even more adjustments on the top of the unit outside of the rack which you know wouldn't you know you wouldn't sort of adjust those after the, the things installed in the rack um, is directed through the BNC u-link on the front panel and is applied to the video corrector here the video signal is subjected to various stuff pedestal clamping synchronizing signal level control and white clipping for all you uh, um, video aficionados uh, who are familiar with uh, video you know the PAL uh, video standard and it really gets meaty now the video corrector output is subjected to quadrature distortion compensation at the quadrature detector which is an optional circuit and then directly when no quadrature corrector is used fed to the receiver equalizer now the video signal is subjected to pre-correction of specified group delay for the receiver compensation huge amount of stuff going on here at the next transmit equalization the overall amplitude response of the transmitter and group delay are compensated again in case of the transmitter with a sin diplex of the tx eq is mainly for the compensation of group delay caused by the sin diplexer so where this is all outside of the system now like the sin diplexer as we saw before is a totally separate unit which gets um fed uh, part of the signal gets fed back in here after a level adjustment the tx equalization is subjected more pedestal clamping dc restoration is fed to the modulator uh, and then it goes through a bounce modulator and, and ballast modulators are pretty simple they just consist of four diodes there's not much going on there at all as we'll see in the schematics the if modulated signal is subjected to level amplification and the surface acoustic wave saw filter having the characteristics of a bandpass filter concurrently forms a vestigial sideband and low pass characteristic for limiting video bandwidth the saw filter output is amplified and becomes the visual output of the modulator the video corrector quadrature corrector and clamping at the modulator may be disconnected by means of available switches applicable switches oh goodness i you know the amount of effort that goes into ensuring that the video uh signal 
is all good when it comes out of this thing is just absolutely phenomenal and then we've got the audio uh, one as well which is a separate audio path to the video as I said all the way through this thing completely separate audio and video and there's the block diagram of the audio path of the system differential amp of course I've got some pre-emphasis on there um, oh, looks like FET attenuation there that's interesting. Um, a modulator, uh, oscillator, VCO. Uh, we've got our, our source and output. M divider, phase detector. We've got some PLL stuff going on there. And then there's our crystal main crystal oscillator input. There's a circuit diagram for our FM uh, modulator there. As you can see, there's not much in these things. I mean, you know, single transistor. They do have some uh, variable capacitance diodes, very caps in there. But, you know, there's not a huge amount. But, of course, the, you know, the theory behind behind uh, this sort of st stuff uh, working. Geez, you could do whole separate videos on that. Then we have a very nice internal wiring diagram of here. Like here's all the uh, stuff on the front panel, all of the connectors, all of the indicators on the front panel here. And this is all the rear panel stuff. And this is really, there you go. So we've got multiple plug-in PCBs. So that's what we can uh, expect inside this thing separate uh, power supply circuitry generating uh, plus 12 plus 15 10 and minus 10 as well modulation uh, so we've got a video modulator board that's what v mod stands for uh, we've got a color equalization board by the looks of it and we have our uh, video corrector board and we have our audio modulator board so looks like we've got quite a few boards inside this thing when we crack it open and then we can flick through other stuff like the IF corrector, which I don't have, but there was actually some reasonably interesting uh, stuff in the IF corrector there. And if you want to take a look at that, of course, I'll uh, endeavour to scan this stuff in. And uh, there's the internal uh, block, uh, the wiring sort of block diagram for our uh, mixer, which we'll take a look at. And uh, then we've got our uh, power amplifiers, which are all solid state uh, power amplifiers, by the way. These weren't uh, valve based power amps. So it'd be interesting. <laughs> There's the uh, Tetrode power amplifier. Oh, so this is now we're getting into the uh, other parts of the rack here. And as you can see, so all the different components which go into this. We've got filters and things, a harmonic filter. There we go. We've got a 3 dB coupler here. Each one of these has their own little um, own little section. You know, we're talking about the blowers inside, so the main uh, wire emergency stop button, all that sort of. There's the tetrode power amplifier, the screen power amplifier, the uh, bias uh, screen power supply. Sorry, the bias power supply, uh, TX control unit, which we don't have. And whew, oh, look at this! It looks like we've got uh, some sort of uh, control sequence. Yeah, control sequence of the transmitter. There you go, how it all works, TX control off and on, because this is, whoo, no shortage of stuff in here, let me tell you, unbelievable. This is great, you look at this sort of stuff all day, and then protection, we've got a whole separate section on all the mechanical and electrical interlocks inside this thing here we go how to turn the plate and how it turns the plate off emergency stop screen grid, grid circuit plate circuit all that sort of stuff cylinder key how the keys go in uh, sequence as we saw in uh, the previous video and setting and adjustment of this thing how you adjust it let's take a look look at all the work that went into installation here we go well, yeah, look at the cabinet I've got pull out. Uh, these are all A3 uh, stuff here. So, yeah, there we go. Look at this. All hand drawn, all hand done. NEC, Nippon Electric Co. Somebody signed it, I don't know. Engineering checked, approved, all that sort of jazz. Look at that. Beautiful. And they had to go through and produce all this lovely documentation for, you know, a, a couple of thousand units, uh, basically, sort of tops. There's the uh, rack that we, we've taken off. Nice three-dimensional drawings there. Very nice. All the air filters. Oh, my goodness. Assembly of the VHF transmitter. Look at that. That's the transmitter part of the rack. Oh, all the different parts of the rack. Fantastic. 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 There's more than you can poke a stick at. 
Unbelievable. So, yeah, I won't bore you with the details. I've already bored you with enough details here. The plate power supply, for example. Power supply circuit. Oh, frequency response. Adjustment. How do I... Ah, now we're getting into the video. The input uh, signal level waveform modulation and voltages. Things like that. Adjustment. Height of the tuning plate, length of the uh, quarter resonance bar for the secondary tuning. Oh, goodness. Operation. Here we go. Emergency control. Stop. How it all works. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Maintenance. And here's what we'll take a look at first, which is the IF uh, modulator. And this will contain all of the circuit descriptions and the adjustments, how to adjust in detail, and the full circuit diagrams and the parts layouts. It's all here. Fantastic. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, it's roughly divided into a chassis and plugged in tight printed circuit boards. There we go. So we know pretty much what we're going to get inside this thing. And uh, the audio frequencies, the, uh, yeah. They're the IF uh, frequencies, of course. That's the general uh, block diagram operation of the board, similar to what we saw before. And oh, video corrector, here we go. Here's how the video corrector works. Look, block diagram of the APC loop, all going on there. Fantastic. You've got the, feed, you've got the divider feedback, your phase detector, PL, a voltage controlled oscillator. So you've got it all happening there. It explains all how it works. This is interesting. Look at this. Examples of, uh, is that on camera? Yeah, examples of pre-distortion curve for the TX equalization, pre-distortion curves for the RX equalization, the phase equalizer, all this sort of stuff, vital to getting the, you know, the highest quality video signal you can. And somebody, you know, some little old granny watches it on her old, you know, crusty old 34 centimeter analog TV filled with snow. And yet, you know, here's all the gear, you know, and somebody's, you know, all fussed over all the details of the exact, you know, getting the phase and the distortion of the video signal and everything else right, the levels and the, ah, oh, man. And, and, you know, eh. People just don't care, you know. This sort of all, this sort of stuff is all designed for probably well over-engineered in terms of what was required for like a regular, uh, you know, analog uh, TV signal. Because it's, you know, it's not that great. Although I guess it's hard to say what happens if you tweaked one of those pots on the front panel. What the user would actually uh, see if this thing was out of, uh, out of, you know, out of adjustment, really. So. Eh, check that out. There's a block diagram of the generation and compensation of distortions in the transmitter and the receiver. Unbelievable. And there's the overview of how the double balanced mixer works. Fantastic stuff. Not much going on here, of course. You've just got two transformers, you know, four diodes, and it does all the magic. But uh, the theory behind that, hey, that could take up a couple of fundamental Fridays. And it talks about the VSB filter, how it's double sideband modulated and all that sort of jazz. And oh, it's all here, how the saw filter works. There we go. Uh, so we'll probably uh, be able to take a look at that when we open it up. Here's the alarm and uh, metering circuitry, which is uh, really quite interesting because, you know, it basically gives you a visual indication on the front panel that there's a fault in an individual uh, circuit. So they've got uh, the signals coming over and there, you know, there's not much going on in here. They're just buffering those or actually, uh, you know, doing a bit of level detection there and a comparator and just, you know, switching. In this case, they're actually doing some relay switching. I guess that actually physically disables the uh, output, perhaps. I didn't know it actually did that. I thought it just indicated that something was wrong, but it looks like it may actually uh, physically uh, disable something. I don't know, that's very interesting. And here's all the adjustment pots available inside this thing. I mean, just incredible. Look, these are all, that looks like the front, yeah, uh, they're the front, so that's the front panel. So there's all these little adjustment pots on the front panel, as we'll see. And that looks like it's a, yeah, top view. So that's internal circuitry. They look, aha, uh -huh, different cards. So when we open it up, we're going to see different cards. Looks like we've got our audio modulation, our video corrector, our color equalizer, 
equalization, our video modulator, and our SBF there on the different, and there's looks like a front panel board as well for adjusting stuff like that, and our power supply over here. So that's what we're going to see when we pop this stuff open, and you're probably getting quite sick of this by now, adjusting the AM component stuff. Dave, show us the hardware. Shut up and show us the hardware. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Keep your pants on. Total characteristics of the equaliser, phase equaliser, adjusting the colour phase equalization. Oh, adjusting the visual modulator. Oh, frequency response. Unbelievable. Woohoo! Here we go. Have we got ourselves some schematics now? It looks like we do. Now these are really interesting. It looks like we have one page per board basically, but it's a block diagram level which could maybe follow the functional layout. They may have laid out the board to functionally match this block diagram. That will be interesting to see when we physically take these boards out. So I may actually come back to these diagrams and then show you these and then the different parts of the circuitry. Oh yeah, there's our fed attenuator that we are talking about before. There we go. Um, yeah, I've FET. I don't know if it's actually field effect transistor. I don't know. Um, maybe FET means something else. I don't know in uh, this parlance. No idea. But yeah, we may actually come back to this because this is interesting stuff. This uh, That was our audio corrector, or audio modulator by the way. Then we've got our video corrector and then Looks like we're going to colour equalisation. So these are all of our different boards. I don't know if they'll actually have the block diagrams, you know, uh, on the silk screen of these boards or not. Here we go. Here's all our internal uh, drawings for the front panel and all the internal stuff. But yeah, um, maybe they will actually have the, all this sort of stuff uh, silk screened on there, you know, like a, the board. Oh no, here we go. Here's our, all of our uh, block. Here's all of our uh, component overlays. Not sure if these boards will have silk screens. Actually, they may not. That's why they actually provide uh, component overlays for each board. But you can see we're all going to get all through hole. Look at this transistors everywhere. As far as the eye can see, little uh, transport, little inductors everywhere. Ah, oh, it's all going ICs. Look at this in the old uh, round metal can packages. Fantastic. That's what we're going to see inside this thing. It looks like we've got some uh, coax, uh, semi-rigid coax on the boards. So that'll be interesting to uh, check out when we open them up. So there you go. I've whet your appetite for what we're going to see inside the... Uh, and next, then we've got the IF corrector, which we don't have. And then we have the uh, mixer, which we'll take a look at. And so forth and so on. Oh, look. Hey, look. Look at this. Somebody's photocopied this. And this is interesting. Look, got some notes here. Here we go. Jam? No, Sam, is it? Sam, further through on our Tarman transmitter, excited switcher, VHF mixer, level, maybe noise, uh, sufficient, check, must, Tom. There you go. So <laughs> they've got the original uh, notes in here of people who've actually worked on this gear and done stuff and maybe set it up because this is all the original documentation dating right back to 1981. Oh, look at this. The temperature compensated crystal oscillators have, which are done by a third party company, I believe. They've, uh, they're marked on the front by a third party company. They've got their own documentation, including all of the, uh, the specs and we've got the schematic and everything else. This is really, really juicy stuff. I love it. Here's the aging characteristics for our oscillator. Oh, brilliant. We'll come back to that, but check it out. There we go. There is our temperature compensated crystal oscillator circuits, parts list. These are for all the different types because there's a couple uh, used in all the gear here. Here we go. They're actually bolted onto the uh, front panel. There you go. They're a uh, Kinsiki Sisha lab, however you pronounce it. So they're the main um, temperature cr uh, compensated crystal oscillators in this thing. And lastly, in the back here, I wanted to show you that ta-da! They've got <laughs> semiconductor section. It's actually the data sheet 
section because hey there was no internet back then right you couldn't just access the data sheets you had to have the data sheets photocopied and put in the back so here's all the silicon rectifiers you know look at this 250 amp silicon rectifier in there in a in a tab uh, pin package that mounts on the panel man unbelievable here we go transistors 2sc 1889 transistors and then we'll get uh, there we go, RF power transistor. Brilliant, 125 watt. There we go. That would be one of the um, RF uh, power transistors used in the solid state uh, power amplifier, which we'll uh, end, no, end up taking a look at. Positive rest, 7912 voltage regulator, and so on and so forth. All the Motorola stuff, which you'll recognize. And there's probably some NEC chips. Yep, NEC, you know. Because NEC, of course, are a huge semiconductor manufacturer, so they can certainly wideband general purpose amplifier. There we go, in a package. They just rolled their own stuff, right? NEC would, you, because this is uh, the whole rack and systems designed by its solid state relays. Ah, oh, man, NEC did tons of semiconductors, so they could just roll their own chips whenever they wanted. There's a juicy overall. Uh, block diagram for the three five kilowatt in parallel transmitters. I love it with the combiner. That's the complete coaxial switching equipment outside or all the SINs that we had a look at in the previous video. So the whole system level uh, block diagram. Brilliant. So I know I waffled on there and uh, yet some people that may not have been interesting but I find this sort of documentation fascinating and look at it. That's just one of the manuals. I mean that's just crazy. I mean this doesn't even include the power amplifier example. That's in the second volume of this thing. It's just crazy the amount of work, the amount of people that must have worked on this back in you know 1980 to produce all this for something that they're only going to sell as I said you know a couple of thousand of these things was phenomenal so I don't know how many you know engineer years of work went into producing that but that's just awesome you don't get that these days so let's take apart the HPA 3696 NEC IF TV modulator and as I said functionally I think this is the most interesting unit uh, out of the lot because you know it, it does all of the video and audio correction and tweaking and modulation and clamping and generating the waveform you know doing everything like that doing the whole business and generating the IF frequencies which then go off onto the um, mixer and then out to basically you know pretty much uh, sent out to the transmitter so this does all the real interesting stuff and uh, as you can see really nice block diagrams on the front functional block diagrams along with uh, fault indicators which there it's not got fault it's just got off so I guess this section is switched off it's faulty the little light up and as I said you can adjust a uh, little uh, little adjustment pots I don't know if they're 10 turn or uh, single turn we'll take a look at those but uh, you can adjust the modulation level the white clip level the sync level the modulation level uh, and then we've got a uh, frequency uh, check output for our uh, audio crystal oscillator frequency check output for our video oscillator here and then what have we got line we've got input here uh, which comes from uh, the inputs actually come from the rear these are the two outputs here which then go up to the uh, IF corrector and then go on to the uh, mixer and then we've got some a nice little uh, panel meter here which allows us to do some tests you know allows the um, uh, operator you know the technician to come along and sort of you know measure things make sure everything's working hunky-dory the power switch for example you can't accidentally uh, do it you know and can't accidentally flick it off and kill everyone's TV all over Sydney because that would really ruin your day so it's one of those locking types you have to pull it out and that's the same across all this gear it's designed so that you can't do anything really stupid to it and then take a look at the top I mean these are obviously designed to be uh, you know tweaked sort of at the um, installation setup level and not actually uh, tweaked you know, not for the technician to just come along and, eh, you know, tone. I don't think, you know, Channel 7's looking a bit shitty today. I think I'll, you know, tweak the, uh, 
you know, the white clip level or something like that. So anyway, you know, I've got clamp, receiver equalization, uh, video correction, preemphasis. You can actually turn these off or on whether or not you actually uh, want them in your system. Do you want video correction? No, I don't want it. Thank you very much. Just disable it. I guess, you know, it allows you better than just taking out the board. Maybe you can't the board has to actually be fitted. You can't just take out the video corrector board because it'll be part of all the uh, signal path flowing through this whole thing. So APC off and on, transmit equalization, all that sort of stuff. You know, setup stuff and adjustment pots as well, all through this top. More adjustments than you can poke a screwdriver at. And on the back here, we've got a huge uh, heatsink for the power supply, obviously. Uh, anodized, we've got some uh, power transistors with uh, covers on the back there. We'll be able to take those covers off and have a look. And uh, we've got our 240-volt uh, AC input over here. I have no idea what sort of connector that is. It's a you know <laughs> weird-ass-looking uh, three-pin connector. Audio uh, control output, you know, your guess is as good as mine what that connector is. I don't know, maybe it is an industry standard connector, but hey, you know, I've never seen it before. And and then, you know, we've got uh, jumper links like this, for example, and these things would have had to have been, you know, produced and supplied. Can we... Uh, oh, I got it. It popped apart. The seal on that was absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, they would have had to have made these, engineered these to the precise length to to go on these, and these are all over this NEC gear. There you go, manufactured April 1981. There you go, it's 30, almost 33 years old. Serial number 344. So they didn't make many of these things. And there you go, that's our video uh, TCXO. And that's 38.9 megahertz, which is the intermediate frequency that the video signal gets modulated up to, and which then finally gets uh, subtracted from the local oscillator uh, frequency in the mixer, which we'll uh, see later. And here's the audio one that is uh, 8.3501 megahertz. These are manufactured, both of them, in December 1980. So there you go, they're relatively uh, small units actually, unless they extend a long way uh, back into the input there. They're relatively small for a uh, temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And what do we have here? What looks like some sort of weird ass old style lamp is actually, if we ro if we rotate that, pull it out, ta-da! Fuse holder, complete with O-ring. Look at that, geez, it gone to town. And look at what we have here. The top panel here looks like it's designed to be easily uh, or come off for real easy servicing. And the way they've engineered that is to have a larger cutout there so you don't have to take out the screw and then lose the screw. So that's bad design for servicing. So don't want that. So we undo the screw like that and we undo them all and then we can just doop, slide our panel off. Brilliant. So here we go. Let's pop this sucker off and uh, oh, look at that. We've got ourselves some nice felt in there <laughs> to hold the boards in place. Look at that. First thing I am going to do, of course, is... Oh, give it a smell. Yeah, that 30-year-old electronic smell. Beautiful. The other thing you have to remember is this has been operational in a rack for 30 years. And, you know, it's not like it's been recently serviced. And I don't see any dust at all in this. None. Zip. Beautiful. Looks like it was the day it was built. And this is lovely. Look at this. Multi-card construction with sliders with a big motherboard at the bottom, which I'll show you, but let's... Can I just... Yeah, these aren't... These aren't screw knobs. These are just knobs to help you... Oh, pull out a board. And, ta-da! There's one of our boards. And we'll take a look at... Uh, each board. Oh, there we go. Shielded on the back. Look at that. Beautiful. All the uh, transistors heatsink there. Lots of heatsink compound. Oh, lots of glue under the bottom. Oh, hot snot under the bottom of that. Oh, that looks beautiful. Ta-da! There you have it inside our main rack here. All of the uh, individual uh, boards, they're all labelled. Check out all the, uh, all the connectors. Look at these huge, big, beefy card edge connectors. 
really love them. I don't know who the manufacturer of those is, but ah, oh, they're beautiful. So big baseboard, it looks like, I don't know, we might have some sort of I don't know, relay or something over there, perhaps. But look at all the uh, wiring, all uh, loomed, cable tied and stuff like that. Got a couple of uh, components on the back there. Um, some of that, but yeah, or oh, that's all coax wiring all down there. Power supply over here, obviously. Oh, there's so much to take a look at in here, but really, I mean, all of the wiring looms down in there. Then the coaxes are terminated down to the bottom boards, uh, to the baseboard down there like that. Little uh, standoffs there, all individually wired on. Very nice. We've got some rigid coax happening here too. Check it out. There we go. Got some rigid coax just flowing from there to there. So, the, you know, this serious rigid coax flowing all the way around there, right down to the bottom, which we can't see, but, ah, oh, beautiful. The amount of engineering that goes into this is huge. And there's really, you know, it's hard to know if there's a bodge or not, really, because it's all sort of, you know, it's not designed for high volume production, high volume manufacture. They really haven't taken that into account. They're not trying to shave cost off. They're just getting this job done and engineering it well, but not well for in terms of like high volume production and automated assembly and all that sort of cost saving, all that sort of stuff which you get in consumer gear. You're not going to find that here. So, you know, they don't care if somebody has to sit there all day and, you know, hand wire all these cable looms. Hey, doesn't matter. And there's the front board, which is uh, interesting in its own right. Ribbon cable, didn't really uh, expect to see that in there. But obviously that's, you know, some logic uh, sort of stuff going over to the uh, front panel indicator board. Some relay action happening up here. Once again, I don't know, that's, you know, it's K112MC5107. Not actually sure what that is no it's an ic it's got ic on it so yeah not entirely sure there but uh yeah that dries all the indicators and has all the uh other pots on the front panel but that's not all uh oh no there's some high frequency stuff there happening because we've got some rigid coax going across here and across the top there like that so yeah that's all happening because that's all the modulation stuff. So that's all at uh, video or IF uh, frequency. And uh, then we've got some uh, coax terminated going down to the baseboard down there. And there is the back of our um, uh, TCXOs there. So they didn't extend very far into here at all. They weren't very deep. I'm quite, uh, quite surprised like that. I expect them to be a fair bit bigger. All right, let's take a look at some individual boards. This is our uh, audio uh, modulator board. There it is. I'm quite uh, surprised to see some uh, shielding cans on the audio modulator board here, which we don't see on uh, some of the other some of the other boards. Uh, for the video, for example, uh, you know, higher frequency stuff don't have these shields on them. So that's uh, rather interesting. And we've got some rigid coax on here as well going there. Now my theory that the uh, board would have followed, maybe the layout of the board would have followed the uh, block diagram up here. No, not really. Yeah, you know, kind of the case. I mean, you know, there's our CMRR pot over there. There's our input level pot. So these, you know, adjustment pots are in the positions of the switches up here. Oops, sorry, I don't think you can see the top of that. But sort of, you know, so they're in positions on the board, but. Uh, whether or not the circuitry, I mean, your differential amplifier is probably going to be that beast there. It's going to be around there, you would expect. Um, then our, what's, what they call a FET attenuator there, that's probably around that section there. Perhaps um, the pre-emphasis is switched off and on here. Looks like we've got some regulation, perhaps. Um, but, you know, I mean, look, here's our phase detector and our divider. That's probably under here. I'm guessing a buffer amps, I don't know, yeah, it doesn't doesn't hugely follow here, so, eh, so much for that. And for fans of rigid coax, there it is, metal outer, there you go, and uh, there's the, um, there's the uh, dielectric on the inside, plus the inner conductor in there, off to these nice little PCB uh, standoffs here, 
really a PCB like uh, turrets. There's our gold plated edge connector. That would have been top quality uh, uh, gold plating, of course, not some skimped one hung low thing you get these days. Now that's interesting. Take a look at this resistor here, which is mounted on some PCB pins there and there. Whether or not that's like a repair afterwards or whether or not they sort of, you know, assembled those at the factory, you still, still see some flux residue on that from the uh, soldering of that thing. Um, they haven't, and you can see it on the pins there as well, they haven't actually cleaned up uh, some of the flux on there. Eh, that's a bit ugly, but still ultra reliable. 30 years later, not a problem. This stuff was still operational. And notice the cleanliness of the board. As I said, there's no dust on this thing. Not a speck anywhere. But anyway, that's interesting why they decide to put that on there, whether or not that was selected after they sent the value was selected after they assembled the board. I don't know exactly. And we have a bodge. Look at this. We have a bodge wire going over there. There's not many, from a cursory glance of all these boards, there's not too many bodges on here, but that's certainly one. Check out the standoff for this IC here. What I originally thought at first glance might have been some oozing hot milk glue is actually a manufactured plastic standoff specifically for the pins to come out because the pin out of this thing is much larger. I'll show you a better one uh, later where you can actually see the pins. In fact, this one's actually better. There you go. You can actually see the individual pins coming out of the package. NEC branded, of course. All these ICs, uh, most of them are going to be NEC uh, branded parts, all the analog stuff, but mounted on those interesting standoffs. So they really didn't want to mount those things on the board. And the reason for that, well, the uh, pins are probably too sp closely spaced on there. So if they had the pins coming straight down and they uh, mounted these, you know, directly onto the board in there, then the wave soldering uh, process of this thing going on the bottom probably would have uh, shorted those pins out during manufacture. So that's probably one of the reasons. There's, you know, this is not a very dense board at all. The components are very well spaced out. Look how they've cut and inserted little insulating sleeves on the base of these capacitors. Ah, oh, isn't that gorgeous? And check out the original axial capacitors, electrolytic capacitors on here. Once again, NEC branded. They're such a huge corporation. They did everything. And uh, you'll notice, like, they're the original ones, and they've got plastic uh, sleeve there, you know, like heat shrink uh, tubing over those. So... These ones look suspiciously modern, and the solder joints on there indicate that these suckers have been replaced at some point. So this board has been repaired. And there's another pretty modern uh, 220 mic 10-volt uh, axial capacitor there. But by modern, hey, this could have been repaired 10, 15 years ago. But it's certainly not 1980s original. We've got ourselves some slug-tuned inductors there, and they've been sealed. You'll notice the gunk on there to hold those in place to make sure they don't come loose. Somebody's got their tongue at the right angle and tweaked those. And the trim pots there are rather interesting. Haven't seen that exact uh, type before. I'm not actually sure who manufactures those. Surprise, surprise! Upon closer inspection, NEC manufacture the pots as well. And there we go. I took those uh, cans off and obviously they decided uh, these two uh, separate bits of circuitry were so critical here that they needed to put those inside those shielded cans. This looks like it's possibly the uh, divider up here for the uh, PLL, uh, perhaps. I would uh, be guessing at that. We'd have to have a look at the uh, circuit diagram and uh, block diagram and take a look at that. But And trust me, you're not missing anything under there. There's nothing going on on the bottom of these boards, so it's really not worth taking the bottom shield off these things. And well, here's the full schematic diagram for it, which I found in volume two, and the overall block uh, schematic diagram, which I found in volume one. So it is actually scattered around the place a bit. And this is just the analog modulator board, which we've got here. And uh, yes, I did find the FET I was after. So that uh, FET attenuator up there, I did find it. Oh, I found a FET. In there, there you go. I thought it was all uh, discrete transistors. There's a there's a FET, and we've got ourselves a Darlington there, and uh, all sorts of things happening. And there's our divider 
uh, circuitry. They've got some waveforms on here as well, which is really quite nice with signal levels. So great for troubleshooting, stuff like that. All sorts of stuff all over the shop. So they're our, uh, see if I can v, uh, see, uh, divide by 16, divide by 16, divide by 8. So they're our PLL. Um, yep, that's what was under that uh, can that I showed you there, so they, they're those chips there, so I was right, that was a good guess, the divider, you can tell because, you know, there's sort of, you know, there's a bypass cap on each, each one, it's sort of a digital type uh, configuration, there's not much analogue uh, circuitry surrounding that bit on the input here, bit on the output, so that's all part of the uh, phase lock loop, dead giveaway. Aha, uh -huh, silly me, that uh, FET we saw before was not our uh, uh, FET attenuator, it's over here, which matches our block diagram, of course. You remember that? There's our differential amp in, there's our FET attenuator there, and that's exactly what we've got up here. There's our differential amplifier there, discrete uh, transistor differential amplifier, of course, and there's our FET attenuator over there, and that's just been uh, amplified by an op amp on the output. Bob's your uncle. So all of this schematic does really match that overall block diagram very nicely. So you can like put these one on top of the other and you can go, right, here's our phase detector right here. And bingo, there's your phase detector going to be in there. And, you know, it really is. So there's your DC amp, uh, your low pass filters happening in there, all sorts of stuff. So it really is uh, quite easy to follow when you have the schematic and the block diagram here. It's beautiful service in this thing. Must have been a dream. We've got ourselves an audio uh, transformer here, 600 ohm uh, output impedance. That's coming out of here, and that's going out to our audio output. So all that work just for an audio modulator board. There's a lot that goes into that. I hope you appreciate the level of engineering which goes into transmitting your TV signal, because it's incredible. This is just the audio part. This is just one part where they just modulate it. And well, I can't go through every board in uh, minute detail. We'd just be here forever. We've already been here forever. But take, for example, this uh, video corrector uh, board up here. And, uh, you know, we've got similar stuff, sort of, you know, discrete uh, amplifiers uh, happening here, all NEC branded and, you know, pretty much uh, traditional through-hole technology. And it was right when I mentioned before that this uh, sort of stuff, you may have noticed it before on the other diagrams, but there you go, 9th of October, 78. Even though this was manufactured in uh, 1980, I think, um, yeah, 78, this was designed, updated, Rev, in 79. So this is potentially an older design, which they've reused in a more modern uh, system unit. And there you go, if you're curious to know what was happening on that board, that's got the pedestal clamp, the sink level adjuster, the white clipper, once again a differential amp there, video amp, and a uh, then the final uh, video amp output. Oh, terribly, oh, monostable multi-vibrator. Then you've got really jam-packed analog goodness, like on this colour equalisation board. Look at that, lots of uh, trimmers in here because hence you know equalization you have to get in there and you've got to trim everything out Ugh. imagine how horrible it would be to sit there and calibrate and adjust all these things once again we've got some rigid uh, coax happening here to take it from one side to the other these boards are all just you know a double-sided board very uh coarse uh through hole layout but look i mean you know there's hardly any bodges on these boards at all so Really, they did well to put these things together and then, uh, you know, architect it into the whole system design with the bus and everything else, and wow. Then we've got our video modulator board. Um, you know, not a huge amount happening on that. that. We've got some rigid coax. We've got another look at that mysterious device there, but uh, check out that. We've got a thermistor right next to that, so there's some thermal compensation happening there. And check out those two transistors there. They've put a uh, heatsink um, over both of them, but it may not be a heatsink. It may just be the, for thermal equalization uh, to try and match those pairs thermally. Oh, and by the way, the reason this one had so much stuff on it, there you go. It's got a phase equalizer 
uh, receiver and transmitter phase equalizer, and then uh, four stages of uh, pre-emphasis there before it gets to the final amplifier output. And look at all the lovely parts lists inside this thing. That was for that uh, video corrector. There's like 10 page part list for that. Fantastic. So I'm really curious to know what that beastie is. This here looks like, there we go, that could be our uh, balanced uh, modulator. There's our four diodes and our uh, transformers in and out. Let's see if we can find those on the circuit diagram. Yeah, I found it. There's our double balanced modulator with the four diodes and the two transformers there that we actually saw. And that's coupled into IC507 there, which unfortunately, that's what that thing is. I'm rather disappointed. That's just an IC. Ah, MC5107. But why it's in a package like that, that stands off on the board, and no, I couldn't find the data sheet for that thing in the data sheet uh, pack in the back of the manual there. So it's just some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of buffer, some sort of, you know, video power buffer, wide bandwidth buffer. And last we have our video sideband filter. And this one might be rather interesting. Not much in the block diagram here, but look at this. Oven temperature controller. And there's our saw filter up there inside the oven. There you go. Beautiful. So they're pretty serious about that uh, saw filter, that's for sure. And not much else, you know, frequency response compensator. Another buffer, probably using the same one we just uh, saw. So there you go. That's interesting. And yeah, 1978. Good on, good on your T Otami. And check it out. This is the most interesting thing we've seen so far. This they've got to, on mounted on a physically separate board here on standoffs is the oven controller, of course. And this, for all the world, looks like the power element to heat this thing up and the uh, saw filter, the surface acoustic wave filter is inside there, so inside this big aluminium block. This is obviously the uh, temperature uh, sensor, the, the thermistor coming out, so we, you know they can keep the temperature of that loop um, stable. But there you go, so that is rather interesting. And there you go, there's the big uh, power resistor on top of this thing to actually keep this thing, uh, you know, to warm it up. That's rather interesting. It's sort of like a, a uh, ceramic, um, you know, laser uh, trimmed, uh, you know, a, a power resistor. It's, it's really weird. I didn't sort of expect to see something like that in here, that's for sure. Now, unfortunately, to get a look at the uh, saw filter inside this thing, then, well, that might be, uh, might be destructive. It certainly has to be... Uh, desoldered from the board that's for sure and it could be you know glued inside there or uh, or something like that embedded you know potted even inside the aluminium oh, I don't like the look of it but anyway um, yeah <laughs> exactly I was right they've got exactly the same uh, little power buffers there those motor uh, those um, MC, NEC manufactured but MC 5107s and what I've done is uh, taken the screws off for the back panel. So let's pop a, a look under the hood here and see if we can actually uh, get that. See if it is uh, potted or something else. Hello. Hello. We've got ourselves some uh, oh, oh, shielding cans on the bottom. I shouldn't just disturb that. Now I've got to put it back in place. Um, but that's interesting. But look, here we go. Here's the back of the board. Aha. Uh -huh. There's our saw filter. Look at that. Um, huge number of ground pins, but it's basically a huge dip package, but it looks like there's some screws for the aluminium block there, so possibly we can get that off. Look at some of the solder joints there. Not terrific. I mean, this sort of stuff is, uh, the finish on the solder in there, not that great. Obviously, anything that's uh, hand soldered, everything that's wave soldered is, of course, absolutely perfect. But uh, anything that's been repaired, what is that? Maybe somebody's actually uh, repaired these NEC, although they, they, they may have been hand soldered after the fact, um, after the uh, wave soldering uh, process, potentially. So, yeah, um, that's probably why they're a bit dodgy. Here we go, I've undone the screws, and now let's see if we can 
pop that off. Ah, oh, ta-da! Look at that. There we go. It's just a, it's just a brick, basically an NEC brick serial number one hundred and fifty-two. Look at that. So there you go. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a sealed uh, ceramic package there. So yeah, I would to get in there and show you the um, saw filter, the saw element on there, the surface acoustic wave. Uh, filter, yeah, we'd have to destructively take that apart, and then hey, it may not be all that interesting anyway. And I'm not going to do that because that would be an awful shame to actually ruin this thing. It's interesting, you can see some like soot marks because that just rubs off coming up. We're following the airflow of this thing. Check it out, there we go, coming up from here. So obviously, air is flowing up through there or something like that and capturing that soot. I don't know where it's getting it from, but yeah, interesting. So that's possibly the most uh, interesting of the boards because why they've gone to the effort to temperature regulate that uh, saw filter, what is so special about it? Nothing else in this thing is, uh, you know, temperature compensated apart from the uh, crystal oscillator, of course, which is pretty critical to have stability on the main frequency that you're using to transmit a TV frequency uh, all over the uh, city, but yeah, for something like that filter, hmm. And I just look back through the uh, circuit description, and it unfortunately it doesn't shed any light on why that is kept uh, temperature stable. Presumably, they chose uh, a saw filter for its uh, performance to remove. In this case, it's a um, it removes the uh, lower sideband frequency of 1.25 megahertz and the upper sideband uh, frequency of 5.5. Megahertz, and maybe they uh, they chose a saw filter for its performance characteristics, but um, you know the technology of the time maybe dictated that. Well, you got the performance, but to get that performance out of your saw filter, you had to keep a temperature stable. Maybe there was too much drift in there with the transducer with uh, temperature. That's the only thing I can uh, uh, come up with because they've gone to quite a bit of effort there. Just for, you know, a, a basic uh, video filter, but it uses a um, saw technology. Yeah, maybe they couldn't get the uh, roll-off response of the filter they wanted electrically, so they have to do it essentially mechanically, because a, a surface acoustic wave saw filter is, it's, uh, you know, is essentially a mechanical uh, filter. Basically, it's um, it's got a transducer on the input, a transducer on the output, and some coupling mechanism in between. And it's the physical characteristics of how the um, how the waves travel along the surface of of the uh, device that they're or the medium that they're actually uh, using inside there that determines its filtering characteristics. But hey, so they chose it. Off. I think that's the only logical explanation. Chose it for the performance, and then had to deal with the consequences of that. In this case temperature compensated. Now it's time to have a peek inside this power supply and I think this cage two screws here pretty darn easy even got some finger holes here to uh, yep lift that off and oh, too easy. Huh. Look at that. Check out those Philips electrolytic uh, caps here we've got three of them nice big screw terminals on them uh, 15,000 microfarads 40 volts um, and look They've got, I've never seen this sort of package before. They're not completely round. They're actually flattened. It looks like, I th originally when I looked at it, I thought, oh, somebody's crushed it. They've actually got the fl sides flattened down like that. So it's like a, a six-sided capacitor. I mean, it's round at the top, and then they've got a little ridge in there, but then these sides are, are flat. It's rather interesting, and they're all like that. And we've got some big ass uh, through panel diodes there. Look at them. That's our diode bridge. Brilliant. No problem with heat sinking. So basically what we've got here is a big ass uh, linear supply. We've got a dual uh, bridge rectifier here with our four big uh, diodes. We've got three big ass uh, 15,000 mic uh, 40 volt filter caps. It looks like there's a little relay board over there, so I'm not sure what that's uh, doing. That may uh, maybe switch on the power after a power-up delay or something like that. I don't know. I'm not going to look into the manuals. There's the back of the panel meter down in there. Nice big uh, wafer switch down in there. That's that uh, front panel selection for the um, for the panel meter. Where to, you know what function to switch through to the panel meter. And I have to flip the chassis around 
to get a look at the board on the back, which is for our linear power supply here. Ta-da! 2SD357s manufactured by NEC. <gasps> Who would have guessed? And there's not a huge amount interesting on that uh, linear regulator board. I mean, you know, eh, whatever. A couple of huge uh, power resistors in there. Incidentally, there you go. Once again, they've got those um, standing off, but no spacer. None of those fancy plastic spacers we saw on the other board. Oh, no way. Don't want to go to that expense on the uh, power supply board, so I don't know why they did it on the others and not on this one. Uh, who knows? Anyway, ancient stuff going on here. Then we've got our big ass transformer in there and well that's about all she wrote but the interesting thing to note about this is how everything is just spread out i mean they don't try and you know cram this stuff in they've got the regulator uh circuitry right on the back where it needs needs to be near the uh, pass transistors down in there transformer all the um you can see the uh, grill at the bottom there gets airflow through no problems at all the caps are probably massively uh overrated in terms of uh in capacitance and uh working voltage got nice big heat sinking on your bridge rectifier here it seems or your dual bridge rectifier seems much bigger than what you need but that's what you'd expect in a uh, you know a high reliability instrument like this because the biggest thing which is always going to fail in these things is your power supply so i'm not sure of the exact uh you know the full power consumption of this thing but it's not you know it's not going to be huge and this over-engineered linear supply in terms of physical size and probably current and power dissipation and uh, everything else then um you know it's it's to be expected because to get a long life on these things, you really need to over-engineer your power supply. So, no surprises for finding that they've done it. Remember, this thing also has to live in a rack with all that other gear too. So just testing this thing on the bench isn't good enough. It's, you know, it's got to work within a system where the heat is always rising. But hey, these racks do have uh, forced air. Um, well, actually, no, the rack doesn't have, I don't think the rack has forced air going through it. Uh, the valve and everything else and part of the, you know, the real high power transmission stuff does. I'm not sure this side of the rack actually had any uh, blowers in it. it. Maybe it does. I don't know. I'd have to check the documentation. But anyway, there is no dust inside this thing at all. It is a ridiculously clean, considering that it has been in use. Um, you know, basically since 1981, it's just unbelievable the condition this thing's in. It's, uh, it's almost as if, you know, it just rolled off the production line. And we've got one more thing left to crack open, the TCXO. Let's take a look. But of course, as I showed before, we have the full schematics and everything for this thing. So we know what's inside. By the way, that's a lovely little... Uh, custom module you know that would not be off the shelf this would have been uh, you know custom designed for NEC for using these products no doubt and I was wondering how they would have fitted all that circuitry that we saw on the schematic in there before and look at that very crude sort of you know end on construction very nice though I mean they've individually heat shrunk all the leads look at that they even color code them blue and yellow that's just beautiful um but yeah it's really incredibly old school um and all we've got is this case here so that's going to have the uh crystal in it and presumably a heater but you know it doesn't really look like you know um like there's a lot of you know thermal insulation there or anything like that so i you know i really expected something better out of uh you know the main tcxo in uh, you know a tv transmitter like this this is you know it's pretty crude if we have a look at the specs here yeah um you know it's you know it's pretty ordinary i mean we're only talking uh you know from zero to 50 here we're talking uh, 0.5 ppm there you know plus minus five times ten to the power of minus seven that'd be five ppm so you go up a digit and you move the decimal place and you're point five ppm so not really great at all uh pretty darn ordinary aging characteristics uh 0.2 ppm uh there we go and uh, the internal uh, trimmer has a range of uh 2 ppm but yeah eh, not impressed 
Now, it's interesting that uh, the name Kinsekia, I mean, I've used Kinseki uh, crystals before, and they make really good uh, TC, uh, well, digitally temperature compensated uh, crystal oscillators that I've used. And look, they've sort of added the SHA on the end. Uh, Kinsekisha lab. <laughs> Very interesting. So, yeah, uh, Kinseki is still uh, around today. And this is interesting. There we go. It says it uses a uh, Goriat clap system ensuring maximum efficiency. Oh, they're very reliable and popular. Um, I, I've never heard of uh, Guriat Clap. I mean, I've heard of uh, Clap Oscillator before, but uh, apparently it was uh, co- or, you know, founded at the, uh, the discovered at the same time by a Guriat or something like that. And here you go, temperature compensation. It's a poor man's uh, TCXO. In this oscillator, temperature characteristics of crystal is compensated with two thermosensors and a varactor in there, or transistor in place of a diode. Ah, uh, there you go. In case of transistor, characteristics of crystal is compensated with the variation of impedance between base and collector by the thermosensor. So it doesn't, no wonder it looks so crude and un-TCXO-like, is because, well, it's not actually temperature controlled. It's just temperature compensated. And there's a circuit for those playing along at home. I won't go into details, that's for sure. And well, I guess that was uh, obvious because TCXO does technically stand for Temperature Compensated Crystal Oscillator. It's uh, If it was an oven uh, controlled oscillator, it would be an OCXO, oven uh, controlled uh, crystal oscillator. But hey, it's not. But that's sort of what I expected. I always imagined, you know, I heard about all oh, the stability of the TV transmitters. In fact, you used to be able to, uh, there was a project way, way back in the old days where you could actually, uh, you know, a frequency lock and get a frequency reference from the local TV transmitter or something like that. Eh, it's not that great. I mean, you know, point two ppm, blah. It's probably good in the 70s. So there you have it. That's inside the NEC HPA 3696IF TV modulator from the original one used by uh, Channel 7 to transmit the TV signal here in Sydney. And it was uh, rather interesting. I thought, yeah, it was as well engineered as I uh, expected it to be. Rather fascinating. So anyway, sorry, I do not have time, literally, because it's 8 30 p.m. I've gone Tuesday. I've got to get home and uh, edit this video. And sorry, I still don't have time to scan these manuals, but that is the plan. I'm going to scan them so they won't be available uh, until, uh, well, they won't be available when this video goes live. So uh, sorry about that. And I will follow on with the other two units that I've got in future videos. So if you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. The link is, as always, down below. Catch you next time.